welcome to our Biz Huddle podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Cuthbert, Creative Director at Baker Creative. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it. What about the role of how women are being perceived in politics? What's your take on that? You know, right now, um, as an example, in the Republican race here in the in the state, there's only one woman in the race. Um, and uh, let me tell you what happened. And it actually became a question in the middle of the GOP debate that I moderated a month or so ago. I had done an interview with Mike Gibbons and I was um, asking him, you know, about various things, the people he was facing in the race. And Jane Timpkins is the only woman. She headed the Republican Party here in Ohio. She's an attorney. She is married to a very wealthy person, but she has, you know, a career in her own right. And um, we were talking about different issues that were coming up, I think, at the time of the State House. And one of the things I talked to him about was, um, I think it came out of critical race theory and his belief that that there is really no oppression for people of color and and that yeah it was a it was a startling some of the things he said I was taken aback and I and and he was he said something along the lines that minorities and women there that there's really not this level of oppression and so I said so you're telling me women have never been oppressed and he said no no, they haven't. He said, women haven't. He said, you know, there was a choice to stay at home. It made more sense because a lot of the labor was physical. And, and you know, I had limited time, but I wanted to say, you know, have you looked at the wage gap? <laughs> have you, have you, do you know that women weren't allowed to vote? Do you have an understanding of the history of this country for minorities and for women? So, and then along those lines, Jane Timken came up as the only woman in the race. And he said, you know, that's not her money. That's her husband's money. She's never worked. And, I, I, you know, I see a look on your face. You're a little startled. I was a little startled too. Yeah. But I put those comments on the air. And after we aired that interview, um, Jane Timken rightfully so, was angry. And she issued a statement about that she's worked since she was in college and that she, you know, she kind of outlined her career. So during the, during the um, debate, we pay, played that clip of him about her, talking about her and women and said, do you stand by this? And he basically, at that point, said something along the lines of, well, women were denied the vote, so they, they did face that problem. So that's the kind of thing that comes out of these interviews that I think gives insight. Now, there may be a lot of people who agree with that. That may be, his base may think, yeah, he's right. He's, that's what he's saying is proper. I was shocked. And I think a lot of women were put off by that. Well, yeah, it just tells you you don't really understand the audience. I mean, right. women do vote now, so they get it actually. Get it <laughs> Not only that, more than 50% of the voters of the state of Ohio are female. Exactly. So yeah. why would you alienate such a big base right. who could be right. a supporter now that you don't understand, clearly doesn't understand the dynamic? I mean, I'm a Hispanic woman in the firm. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so you've got you've got a, a double reason to be concerned. <laughs> yes, I do. I'm just like, oh, dude, no. <laughs> That's a definitely a surprising thing. Yeah. yeah. So then, how do you see the political landscape shifting? Because it seems like it's always something new, like every five minutes. <laughs> well, I think that right now. And I have been in this business now. I mean, if you count when I started in Pittsburgh, I started in Pittsburgh writing when I was still in college. So that would have been uh, 77. So a long time. I've been in this business a very long time. 
I have never seen in my time as a journalist, the division that we have now. Mm. And I think it's a multi-layered problem in that um, people almost act as if you're on two rival teams and there's no one's meeting in the middle of the playing field. And you, you've got, especially when you have a contentious primary, and as an example, again, I'll use the Republican primary, mm -hmm. some, somewhat to the Democratic primary too, because there, there's a split in, Morgan Harper is much more the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, Tim Ryan more the old school wing of the party. So what happens is everybody starts in a primary season running to their base. And you hear Republican candidates say things that are just not going to fly in a general election. Mm -hmm. You know, I say that, what do I know? Because I didn't think the things that Donald Trump said would fly in a general election. And look what happened here in Ohio. In 2016, he won by eight points. He won by eight points in 2020. So I don't know. I just know that there's a division. People are running more toward the extremes of their party. And it's, it's not allowing for the kind of diplomacy that you think of when you think of our representatives like Democrat John Glenn and Republican George Voinovich, who were known to reach across the aisle in a very productive way for the betterment of the people of this state. Um, both of them would sit and listen to the other side. And the, it, it was true diplomacy. It was true statesmanship. And I, I sadly think we don't see a lot of people on the landscape who are saying, hey, let's all come to the table. Let's all, let me listen, truly listen to what your concerns are. And then you truly listen. You know that old thing where you hold the stick and pass it around the table, you can't talk. We can't give them that stick, they'll hit each other with it. But, <laughs> Telephone with the stick. But that's, that's what I think is missing. And it makes me sound old to say, well, I miss the old days when we had the John Glenns and George Voinoviches, but I think we should all long for those days when we had that level of um, listening to each other that we don't see today. Right, I understand. So you've been a, a reporter for a long time. Yeah. And it's very, uh, with a lot of moving parts and people come and go a lot in different roles, how are you able to sustain your role in your, you know, being a news anchor? I don't know, because I'm old. <laughs> I will be honest with you. One of the reasons when I went to law school, I was thinking, I'm almost aging out of this business. And at the time, I started law school when I was 44. I'm 65 now, and I'm still doing this. Um, I, I, I hope that I have survived here uh, because I have tried to be honest and balanced and fair with people, and, I, and that I truly do still love this job, and I, I really do still try to create content that is meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really know how I've survived as long as I have, but... Um, I will share with you something that I was just thinking about yesterday. And I'm not, uh, there's, a, there's a website called FTV Live, which puts it, uh, puts, it's a, like a gossip website for the TV industry. And it's run by a guy who's been in news for a number of years. He was a photographer. I think he was a news director. He's a terrible speller, drives me crazy. He, he just cannot spell. It's like, get spell check. But anyway, he posts, he very frequently posts videos that he thinks are ridiculous that TV stations are doing, like anchors dancing on TikTok and or uh, reporters in bathing suits. And um, I will tell you, that is the thing that troubles me about women in this business more than anything else. When I started in TV, uh, in reporting, I was a hard news reporter, especially when I was in radio in the early days. I covered all the strikes and the labor issues in the Pittsburgh area. That was a big deal. 
mm-hmm. and, and certainly in, in West Virginia and Eastern Ohio, you know, the coal haulers and the steel, you know, there was a lot of labor news back then. I had exclusively done hard news. And when I got here to television, it was still in this market, women were expected to cover the daycare stories. Women would do education, maybe. They would do lifestyle. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do the triple homicide. I wanted to do the plant blowing up on the South Side. I wanted to do news. And I had to fight to get to do that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I was 28 when I got here. And I remember about six months in, going into the news director's office and saying, you saw my tape when you hired me. You knew the kind of reporting I did. Why am I covering the daycare stories? And he said, well, we like to put women covering stories that other women will relate to. And I said, other women care about triple homicides. Women care about news the same way men did. And so he started gradually letting me do more And then I realized if I want to do these kinds of stories, I've got to come up with these kinds of stories. And eventually it got to the point where I would go in and say, this is what I'm working on today. Because I had, I built that up over the period of a couple of years. Mm -hmm. What I see in this business now, and here's the other thing I'll throw in back then. You remember we always wore, women would wear suits all the time, every day. I wanted to look professional. I wanted to be accepted as a professional journalist. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing now is so many young women in this business, and my phone is is right here, so I can't do it. So we'll pretend this TV remote in my office is is my phone. But it's this. It's taking pictures of themselves. And on, I'm seeing young women in this business post pictures of themselves in bathing suits. Because what they're trying to get is followers. They're trying to be influencers. And I want to say to them, do you know how hard we fought to be accepted and not seen in that way? How many years it took some of us to get through this. Gail Hogan and I have talked about this. If you remember Gail, she's one of my dear friends. And and we've talked about how wow, we laid the groundwork, girls, (laughs) you know, carry that forward, make contacts, break stories, be a journalist. I don't need to see you half naked. And I think that's the thing about this industry. When I leave, I'm going to feel the worst about that. I always wanted to feel like I advanced this industry for women. And I feel like it's, it's taking a giant step backwards. Well, you know, I think some of that has to do with uh, the culture of some of the platforms. And, yeah. and I think they see what kind of pops things. But like you said, I mean, content can win too. It, strategy and how you approach a story and how you tell that story can also be a way to attract and get and be an influence as you already have been naturally yourself. And setting that groundwork and, and trying to fight for those stories within your station I can't imagine didn't lay the groundwork for some other reporters that still work there. And and I'm not, I'm not casting that on all of the young reporters. We have some great young reporters, Jamie Ostroff, our investigative reporter is really good. And um, she, you know, not all, I'm I'm not saying all women in the business, but too many of them to make me comfortable are willing to do that. And I, in a way I sympathize with them because the stations want them to have followers. They want them, they want that influence. They want that online presence. And so that's a quick and easy way to get it. Sure. And, and, you know, they have pressures on them that, that you know, I, I never had in the business at that time because they have to not only create a story for broadcast, but they have to be, and they have to have a following. There, there's pressure on them and there are metrics that they're expected to meet on some of these platforms. It just makes me sad that that's the way that is the easiest way to do it. So that being said, um, you've probably interviewed a lot of different folks throughout the year. 
And what kind of mistakes have you seen female leaders make or women business owners have made? I don't know if I would call it mistakes, but I will say that there was a time when there was this belief that there's a table and there's room for one woman at that table. And I'm going to be the woman at the table. You know, there was that attitude. And so I think especially early on, not only, not just in, in newsrooms, but in businesses where I would interview different women, there was a lot of pressure individually to get to that level. And you didn't see women reaching back and helping other young women behind them. I think that has done a 180. I think now there's a realization for women who make it that, hey, it's great to be first. I want to make sure there's a second. I, I don't think there's as much pressure for to be the one woman at the table anymore because there is an acceptance that there are going to be women at the table. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I, I think hasn't changed enough, you don't see a lot of women in the CEO position. Mm -hmm. you, that's something that uh, I, I think culturally, economically, business-like, you, you don't see enough of. In the same way that you don't see enough of people of color in positions where they are the decision makers. Um, I think that's changing, but I think it's a slow change. Mm -hmm. It is. We present to some boards and it's always uh, interesting the dynamic of the makeup of the board sometimes mm -hmm. we have to present to. Yeah, and it's, and if you have, if everybody making decisions, um, and, and I hate to come down like on old white men because, you know, they're good people. <laughs> but if everyone in that in that decision making capacity is an old white man, it limits the growth and development of your organization in ways that you that probably will make you not be relevant anymore. Yeah. And I think that's showing up in the, the politics behind the scenes, kind of what yeah. you said before. And that's very interesting, yeah. I think. So when this is all said and done, what kind of legacy would you like to leave? <laughs> um, you know, I never have a good answer for that question. I hope that I will be thought of as someone who um, worked hard and tried to make a difference. I would like to, I, I would like to be thought of as somebody who sincerely cared about the community because this is my community. Although I never thought I would be here this many years. Our plan was to be here two years. And here I am 38 years later. Uh, I, and I, and I, I will say, even when I leave this television station, which come on y'all, it's gotta be soon. <laughs> I'm 90. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm not sure I'll be ready to be finished. I, I'm, I actually sit around sometimes and think about, well, now what do I wanna do next? And it's, it's like people, my friends say, what are you talking about next? Aren't you ready to just stop? And, I, and I'm not. So I, I can't answer the legacy question because I don't feel like I'm done yet. I went even as a lawyer too? Uh, well, you know, as a lawyer, uh, I think sometimes I think I'd like to teach a media law class somewhere. I think that would be a fun thing to do. I've really slowed down my practice quite a bit. Um, I will tell you why, because I was doing domestic law for, for about five years, uh, which is divorce and child custody and that kind of thing. And what I found out about in that area of the law is as my practice grew, your clients need you to be available 24-7. Yeah. And I was trying to balance two careers where I would work part-time four mornings a week, four days a week at the law firm. And, and um you know, somebody would call me at quarter to six and say, you know, my husband was supposed to drop the kids off. This is the exchange time. He didn't show up. And, and I'm trying to deal with that and then be on the air in 15 minutes. So I, I realized that this is not fair to these people whose lives are in flux right now to have someone who's pulled in 900 different directions. So what I'm trying to do now that I started basically right around the time of the pandemic, I love legal writing. And so writing appellate briefs or writing briefs for other attorneys is what I'm limiting myself to. Now I did do, I did a pro bono case for someone, a friend of the family who was in a custody battle. So I will do it if, uh, you know, if it comes up, um, handled a divorce for a friend, you know, that kind of thing. 
but I'm, I'm really limiting my practice right now. Well, I appreciate you sharing your insight. I think a lot of people will get some wonderful, uh, just learn a lot from this interview. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. It was fun. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it and feel free to post any questions so we can be inspired by new content. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more, visit our website at bakercreative.co.